So I'd like to begin by saying thank you to the Historical Society for inviting me, putting up on my nervousness, we prayed, and uh, for all of you for coming today. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful seats. That's a nice crowd on a Sunday. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom, for the in introduction that I sent, and it's probably way too long. Um, yeah, so it's nice to be here. Nice to be home. Always great to be home. I, with the exception of one books, one book, sorry, um, one out of eight so far published. They've all, they've all been about home, about the Placentia area. As are the next two coming up, and uh, I'll just do a little bit of advertising. Um, this is so. There's a volume one of Crunch and Munch. These are about talking lobsters that come from Tickle Cove. Uh, Bonavista Bay and they, they get caught and they end up being put safely in Clarenville where they live in a little red shed and they got so they, they talk and they're all their friends are animals all the local pets and uh, are still there or were there and this one ends off where they leave Rajentia and they go on if I remember what it's called a ferry, ferry to Nova Scotia I'm just checking now yeah, okay. Ferry to Nova Scotia, and that's where the f volume one ends off, and volume two picks up where they're coming into Argentia, where Carter, my grandson, who looks about 16 in my, draw my poor drawings of him in the book, you're going to laugh when you see him, but uh, yeah, him and his friend Charlie show up on a quad, and they pick up the lobsters, and they go on a bunch of adventures. Well, they're making their way back to Charlie and Carter's house <clears throat> in Southeast, and uh, where they're going to go see the dogs. And uh, yeah, the new rats didn't make the cut, but maybe the volume three, who knows? Yeah, and they're not rats, he says. It's only their tail, okay? He was right. Anyway. Uh, so this is, I found this, I find this really interesting. I, I'll probably read it in a couple of years. I've never read um, one of my books or a couple of them before ever. But uh, yeah, I'll just tell you the premise. Um, there's three lobsters, Crunch and Munch, of course, and their little sister, Jessie. And uh, they all came from bedtime stories that I made up telling my youngest girls. And years later they they recall them from memory and put them into this book but anyway so in this book jesse thinks she everywhere she goes she sees something and but it's always something from history something that doesn't exist anymore and so the middle brother or sibling always passes her off as being too tired or whatever and the older one knows the history so he is kind of caught between he doesn't want to tell her people that what she's seen is actually real or it actually happened one time. So, anyway, if you're interested, it'll be a little signing at the end. Yeah. Feel free to interrupt me anywhere on the way through with a question. Um, so, what I picked today, um, the topic is so I wrote The Garden Gate as. Some of you know, which is about um, when Argentia Marquis were taken over by the Americans for the purpose of constructing the military and naval and army bases there. Um, it was always a, a source of, I don't know, bitterness for me, just knowing the stories. And I took the title from a quote my grandma, great grandmother always said, by the time I got to the garden gate, the house was in flames. She was hanging their clothes when they, when they came. And, uh, and all that stuff gets lost over the years. And I started researching that well over 30 years ago. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's a good segue into this thing over here. Why not? Just to show you anyway, I'll, I'll talk about it for a second. I can show you later. Um, this clock over here, I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not, but. Uh, so yeah, the garden gate and this this clock came from uh, my second great grandmother. Um, she was Mariah Whiffen. Her father came from Wales in 1800 to Bonavista. 
1838 moved across to talk about switching religions we were talking about earlier. He arrived a Methodist and became Anglican and Bonavista or Protestant. And in 1838 he moved uh, to Southern Harbor, St. Chabay, of course, where he became a Catholic. He's married six times and had 29 youngsters who all lived and have all their names and their dates of birth and all this stuff. I wouldn't say they all live, but I have the, the list anyway. Um, yeah, so that's the clock from her house. And she was only born in 1840, so, uh, and she died two weeks before her 100th birthday in 1940. Uh, and this would have been her parents or her husband's parents that I don't really know. So, because how am I going to know, right? There's no one left to tell me, so. Yeah, so that's the garden gate. And, um, and the next one, getting back to my topic, um, so yeah, and this, this was just acquired by the school system in the province this year. I don't know if it's in yet or not. I don't even know how that stuff works. No one tells you anything, right? So, yeah. nod and smile, say thank you. And uh, so swept away picks up where the garden gate leaves off and it's set in fresh water because most of the Argentia residents and, Mar and Marquis also, I just use those two town names. The, indicate that what we know is the north and the south side. Um, they moved to fresh water and so it swept away, so it, en it encompasses all that, it picks up socially where the garden gate leaves off. And so in there you get all the changes. And it's also a love story um, gone bad. And you know that right off the bat, it, it, you know right away that there's a man and a, uh, two 18 year olds. She's just uh, newly burnt out of her home in Argentia with her parents. And uh, he falls in love with her. After about a year of tormenting her or whatever, he, uh, mm. they become an item. And uh, so she gets washed out of a dory one Sunday afternoon and he spends the rest of his life looking for her. Just ruin that for you. No, I'm just kidding. You know that right away. It's, it's a lot of flashbacks and stuff like that. So. Um, so, moving it all in that vein, um, I'm going to read from what I wrote there now. So the topic is how, or, or what kinds of impacts the American presence had on our area, on our culture in general. So, am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me? Yes? yes? Yeah. Okay. Now I look probably just like the person I said, you know, definitely going to put into that next book uh, that's set in the 1980s called Age of Innocence. Yeah. It'd be wrong not to put it in there. Anyway, so I'll just read what I have there. So Swept Away is set in rural Newfoundland and we can jump back and forth. If anyone has any questions about Argentia that I might know of, I chose to read about my own family because you're only supposed, you should write what you know and this is how I feel about it. Stephen King said that in his only book about writing, called On Writing, Write What You Know. So that's what I did. So I just narrowed it down and because every single family would have their own stories, of course, and their own experiences, their own feelings and all that. So Swept Away is set in fresh water in the early 40s. That's where it begins. Uh, it combines both natural and physical attributes um, through both its characters, in their accents, dialogue, chores, and lifestyle, and the weather, the land, and the changes to the land, and the perpetual uncertainty of living both with and by the sea. So the setting, again, is in fresh water. Um, because of the uprooting of residents from the dismantled communities of nearby Argentia and Marquis for the building of the U.S. base, um, there grew a town from it had six families. I remember one time uh, I learned this from Miss. Did anyone remember Miss Barb Patterson? You would, yes. of course, librarian, um, and she was a good friend. And uh, talking one day in her house, and she told me her best friend lived in Freshwater, and she used to walk from Placentia to visit her friend. And uh, there was seven houses in Freshwater in total, and one of them was abandoned. Was that? old one. When I was growing up it was called the Haunted House, remember? The one in, in the meadow next to us. 
Yeah. I didn't smile either. Yeah. But yeah, so it grew from a town of six families to several hundred. Because of the influx of literally thousands of Americans, people's lives and their general perception of life changed. Two cultures which couldn't be further apart are forced to coexist, therefore tensions arise, friendships eventually, though often reluctantly form, the combination of two nations inevitably invoke change, some considered acceptable while others silently carried overwhelming grief and sometimes resentment in a situation beyond their comprehension and control, which I found out um, while interviewing people for more than 20 years. And those, some of those stories are kind of woven into the Garden Gate with no names mentioned, I think. So furthermore, to the addition of residents of another country to a once quiet town, hundreds of Newfoundlanders from other areas of the then-owned British colony, I say that right, then-British-owned colony, poured into the area for employment offered by the American government. This immense change, jobs on land, in society encouraged lifelong fishermen to leave the sea, to sell their schooners and smaller fishing boats to Americans who used the boats for target practice in preparation of the advancing German Navy and submarines, which happened, as well as for pleasure crafts to be used on their days off, and many schooners were cleaned up and sailed back to the U.S. So given the fact Newfoundlanders, especially those of rural areas, knew little else but the life of catching and preparing fish for sale, the momentous and swift change in, li change in livelihoods affected folks of all ages. Most Newfoundlanders rarely, if ever, held a penny. Now they had opportunities to work only five days a week for actual cash instead of six days of uncertainty upon the perilous sea where wives and children at home waited daily for the return of their loved ones, often in vain. Not only did men lead the sea as a means of um, eking a living, uh, women too, often for the first time in their lives, left their homes for gainful employment on the base. So men lost their places of comfort in the knowing their wives wouldn't be at their beck and call for warm home-cooked meals and whatever else they previously expected and received upon their return from their boats, and women became independent, thus growing in self-esteem. Now there was actual money to pay babysitters and to afford luxuries previously unfathomable, such as gas-powered washing machines, no more scrubbing boards. I doubt anyone here use a scrubbing board. I have one too. Yeah. The way the prices are going, probably be back to using it again. The presence of immeasurable, immeasurable American men lured women by the score into the arms of the charming strangers. Now the former ignorance of racism had little choice but to dissipate, as Newfoundland women married and had children with spouses of various ethnic backgrounds. Some Americans, upon ending their contracts at Argentia's base, moved their families back home to the U.S., which changed part of our society forever. The trading and intermingling of customs, offers and acceptances by Newfoundland families to visit a foreign land, etc., all played a pivotal role in altering the lives of both sides. Other Americans loved Newfoundland and Newfoundlanders to the point where they chose to stay and many remain to this day. It wasn't supposed to rhyme. And the list goes on. Those Newfoundlanders who refused to leave the sea carried on with their ways of life which meant fishing six days a week with Sundays considered a day of rest and leisure. Often the dory ride for a picnic on a nearby beach or a meadow only accessible by small watercraft the only consistent was the sea remained devious, unpredictable, and unforgiving. In this regard, swept away offers an example of a young woman stolen by a rogue wave 
and the endless days, nights, weeks, months, and years of prayers for the return of her body for a proper Christian burial, uh, for closure which may or may not come. That's why you gotta read, you gotta buy and read the book. All so ways of life, virtually unchanged for centuries, are depicted in the remembrances of an old woman with dementia, while the struggle between Newfoundlanders and their invaders often present challenges in the way of arguments and jealousies. Because the Americans associated the base, associated with the base, were rather economically sound, various aspects of both arts and sports found their way into Newfoundland society in the way of photography, uh, exposure to live music through USO shows, which greatly influenced the interest and quality of an endless array of bands from this area, the Placentia area, and sports as well. Um, examples of personal viewpoints and social change are plenty enough to comprise a book of their own. Another case is a change to the vocabulary of Newfoundlanders in, in direct or sometimes indirect contact with Americans. Same may be said of food, for example, pizza, hot dogs, and hamburgers, all that stuff was non-existent prior to the arrival of the Americans. Um, and that's enough to say about that, I think. So does anybody have any uh, stories or memories you'd like to trade with me or mention or? Well, I think the, uh, some of the Americans being here was the Back to the war, the fights between young men from there and uh, the Croatian base. In fact, in front of my house one night, there was a group of about 50 Marines and 50 people from the Cape Shore that met there and had a big battle right in the middle of the road. There was two policemen there trying to separate them all and not too successful. No. So in fact, they didn't break it up and they brought up the Marine police, Marines from the base. It was a tremendous battle. Wow. No surprise. I heard lots of stories like that growing up, you know. Most are not fit to tell the public. Yeah, thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. Any idea what year that might have been, do you mind me asking? It would be, I think, probably in the early 40s. Okay, so right away, pretty much, yeah. I was a young boy then, which was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. A lot of water. <laughs> and it seems like yesterday, right? Yeah. There's another one. See, now it started. There's another one when uh, Sergeant McCormick, who was here in the New Flank and Stabbery then, later John the RCMP, but he had his eye knocked out by a serviceman. And uh, the, uh, the other mount, uh, policeman, I think it was Daly, he told us about a bunch of young fellas. And we were going down the road and we met this American guy and we figured that was it. So we, we said we were going to take him in. And, and uh, he took off and ran across the meadow and we sang out there's a fence here, he won't get out, but there's no fence. <laughs> and then he went in there to Jack and Murray's house. And we knocked him down on the uh, floor, and Joy Kamari brought in some rope, and we tied him up and brought him up to the courthouse to the police office. But uh, on the way up, we're saying, Why well, we should hang this guy? <laughs> so I'm sure he was quite scared. There you go. What a great example yeah. of the way it was, yeah. I've heard of locals like get, getting the. Uh, um, the Americans really drunk and putting them in cabs and, and bringing them out the dirt road as far as they could and just letting them out there like two or three o'clock in the morning and yeah. there was a lot of things that weren't very nice yeah but, but it's still a story so I'm from this side this crowd over here anyone got a story no <laughs> I worked in Dunville in 1958, 59, 60, and <laughs> there was always conflict every Friday. The Americans would come out, and the boys from Dunville would all gather, 
at Ray's night bar in Dublin. Before the night was over, they would have the fight outside, and the mounties were over on the other side, so after 12 o'clock there was no boat. After 9 o'clock there was no boat, so they could have the fight. Mm -hmm. And they'd knock the Americans down, take off their boots, throw their boots up in the woods, and make them walk back to the base of the boat town. Oh. I've never heard, never heard that before. Eh? I'm not surprised, though. Yeah. I'm like, can any of the names we don't <laughs> No, no, we leave names out, yeah. I was hoping there'd be some, uh, I don't think there's any American people here. here. To get their side too would be interesting. It, was, it would be, yeah. Yeah, because. Just, you know, something more left now. How did they feel, you know? <laughs> they come back next week. <laughs> it must be good they came back for They came back the next week. Oh, that's fine. They came back the next day. Came back in their bare feet, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they come, they'd come back and get their boots the next day, yeah. come back in trucks and go up again. Yeah. But sure they came back the next week. Yeah, they loved it. Already for the fight again. Sometimes they won't, sometimes they So I, I wondered if that animosity in society, I guess there's no need to wonder, but I'm just going to ask, asking, asking the crowd, uh, did it always exist or is that just human nature? Because people have been fighting forever. Possible. Like when we were growing up, there was all, if there was a dance, there was a fight after the dance. Oh, yeah. yes. And that never changed. And the same thing gangs from Placentia would come to Freshwater to the teen, uh, they were called record hops then when I was, right? I guess after sock hop and before dances, is this? I don't know. The record hops, yeah. All the boys line up on one side doing this. Yeah. It was in school, there was a nun between you doing this. If you want to get some good stories about the base, you should talk to Johnny C. Yes, I actually invited him now that we've said his name's on camera. Hi, Johnny. Can you see this? I did. I, was, I picked him and him, some other American. I talked to him. I talked to Curtis and I don't remember his stories, but I tried to encourage him to write a book. You know? Yeah, I know. I was, hoping, I was hoping he'd be here today because he would be a great one for this. I did have him in mind. Yeah. You know, Ken Shovel was here at the same time. Ken. I invited them too, yeah. <laughs> Anyone I could think of who was uh, like from from the U.S. that stayed here, right? And, yeah. yeah, the fellow up there in the southeast. I forget his name. Think of that now. Maybe this will generate some interest in them because they've been virtually ignored from day one. And like me growing up, I won't say a hatred. That's too strong a word, but just I don't even. Well, I'll use the word yank, which which I know is, is derogatory. Uh, as much as Newfie to some people, right? But um, yeah, so anyone else have a story or a memory? I appreciate those, yeah. So far, it's all been a bit of fighting. But yeah, so we grew up like that, and I know the generation before us did for sure. So, I mean, did they just walk into something that was, or just escalate it more? Because I've heard a lot of people tell me, well, they had white teeth or teeth at all yes. it's like the hygiene your hygiene was you know it must have been attractive to some women i suppose if you had teeth versus a fellow with no teeth <laughs> <laughs> right i'll go i'll go, I'll go with him yeah the youngsters side. might have teeth then the other side of the story which is more pleasant like they'd often come up to us at the school and come up for a, a truckload of uh, sports equipment and balls and stuff like that and get no to That's a nice story. Yeah. I know they were very generous and very kind. Yeah. I know they brought Santa Claus yeah. to Fox Harbor. There you go. I knew you'd have a story, uh, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, they brought Santa Claus to Fox Harbor. <laughs> yeah. You come in on the uh, helicopter. Oh. Yeah. I remember that. Interesting. And how old were you then? Well, I was probably, or maybe less. I don't know. And the helicopter would have landed where? In someone's meadow, obviously. In the field or something. Field. They always had a field. That became the ball field. Yeah. They used to bring a, a, a truckload of stuff. The, the school in Duncan was on Law Road, then where the St. Anne's Church the school was. That was on Law Road in Dunville. 
that old building was falling down up there. Oh, yes. That was a school at one time. Oh, okay. And they used to bring up a uh, truckload of stuff and give it out to the kids. Nice. You know, they were good like that, yeah. yeah. Even when we were young, I remember going to the Star Hall. Um, Star Hall. Oops. Uh, what's it called? The trade, trade school. And they have a Santa, the Americans who have a Santa there, right? I only know that because we have a picture of it, so, yeah. Yeah, John Wayne wrote an interesting story. In fact, it was recorded and then broadcast on CBC about something like that when they tell us about the bus coming up from the base to pick them up and they picked them up over on Jersey's side there. Uh, Tom Lane, the chimer, was over there. Yeah. And the uh, Chinaman saw him all outside freezing, waiting for the bus, so he invited him in, give him hot chocolate and stuff like that. So, nice. Yeah, John told quite an interesting story nice. there. Yeah, he'd be a great fellow to have here yeah. for stories, yeah. I don't know, my grandfather and, uh, and Raymond, his father, were, were really good friends from, from Argentia, yeah. So I spent my childhood driving around with, with my poppy visiting all the, uh, the old people, Shawak and Murray included. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned him earlier, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, oh, that's good. So did they do that for their entire time here, like by helicopter or until the robe was put in probably in 55, maybe? Yeah, I think in the early days it would have been more active, you know. Yeah. I don't know how long they kept it up to our hair for 50 years. It must have instilled a lot of that stuff into local people too, to do things more for each other maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm lucky enough to have two of these because everybody gives me stuff. I have enough stuff to fill two museums. And I live in the oldest house in Clarenville and I would love to get out of there and turn or turn that into a museum, but it's a, it's a different setting than it's too transient there, it wouldn't work. A museum there in Clarenville, right? Because there's already a museum in Clarenville that doesn't work. It's a railway museum, and no one goes there. So, but, uh, but anyway, so yeah, that's, people know I appreciate all things, and they, I always get surprised with beautiful things like this that I never knew existed. So I got this one. I just noticed a crack in the glass. I don't know if that happened on the way down. It was always there. but. Uh, Hardly matters 160 years later, does it? Mm -hmm. But uh, it actually works. Yeah, I just gotta do some work with it, to move it over and stuff. But it was built, uh, they were built in Connecticut in the 1840s, um, which would, again, um, my great grandmother from the, the Garden Gate, uh, Mariah, they call her Mame. She lived to be almost uh, 100. Uh, she was born 1840, which means she was too, she wouldn't have had this as a child. So it had to be her, from her house. So it's her parents or her husband's parents, one or the other, right? But that's kind of, that's not that important who, who owned it, the fact that it still exists. And have another one like it, I mean, for it's taller, that's from a, a, um, the other side of my, one, another side of my family. But yeah. Any questions? You want to kiss the clock or anything? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> I mean, on the clock. Yeah. Well, look, it stopped at about two minutes after one. Yeah. I do have a winder. I just, this, where it's not working yet, I didn't bring it. The other one is on a the mantle above our. Uh, Stove, yeah. So. Questions about the clock? Or any other antiques? I literally have enough to fill a house. So. I don't know. Antiques are the antiques for sale. Which leads me into the question you were telling me a little bit about the Rosedale Manor and mm -hmm. the Sweetman and the Bear family. And he's got connections as well. Well, my grandfather. Mom's father bought that in the late 70s. And we were there when, when they were, uh, am I talking loud enough? Okay, okay, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, so the Rosedale Manor, yeah, we can talk about every, anything, can't we? It's history, so, okay, takes the pressure off. Staring, staring at these books. 
Yeah. Um, so while my father and my uncle were renovating that, the house was built in 1892, is that correct? Three. Three. Okay, close. Mine's not completely gone. But uh, yeah, so when they were renovating it, a lot of stuff that was going to be thrown out in the garbage, like trunks and all this, like we took that and to this day one one of the big trunks which was yeah and has wooden handles instead of leather I like that feature on it and I stained it cleaned it up stained it and it's our serves as doubles as our coffee table and our splits box in our living room so you don't mind if you spill anything on it or you can't scratch it right so yeah and sorry it's not for sale but you never know I wouldn't sell it to you. I'd give it to you. I wouldn't sell it to you. But right now, it's, yeah, it holds, hides all the splits for the stove and the paper. So it's a wonderful thing, yeah. We have a nine foot door out of that house. Nine, if not ten, I think it's nine. And it's still solid. And uh, I was telling Chris earlier, there's what I think is a drying table. It's, it's like this, only for up in the shed. That's from that house, right? Yeah. But, and there's God knows what else, yeah. And I remember all the cast iron uh, fireplace inserts that were there and they threw them out in the, in the mid 80s when someone else bought it. Have you got any door locks? Yes. <laughs> with, with skeleton keys of every kind, yeah. I got them cut out of doors and everything that actually I got the locks working again and stuff. We went to the slot one that's not working for us for a little bit. Oh, yeah. The one over in the museum, you, you, you can turn it one way and open it, but you can't turn one open if you turn it the other way. Did you take it apart and try to fix it? Yeah, well, I didn't, but I was that. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're like a make and break engine. It's like, there's not much to them, right? Spring and a spark plug. I assume there's probably something broken off. Yes, at least that's all. Weld it back down or something like that. Yeah. It would be brass, right? Or bronze? Could be, yeah. Yeah, not sure. Worth looking at. Yeah. I'll fix lots of that stuff, yeah. Yep. Anybody got a sign or anything in them? <laughs> You get a small audience now by singing with small audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was always impressed by the uh, the local music scene here, the, the amount of bands that came out of this area, and knowing a lot of them that are, you know, whatever, whether they're here or now or not, doesn't matter. But uh, they were all influenced by the Americans, and I know of one band at least from here that were offered to go on a tour of the U.S. Yeah. by the Americans, but they, they never even, yeah. John Meyer was in that band. John Meyer was the bass player. What were they called? Starts with an R. <laughs> Some no help to you, but. I don't remember. I uh, that was common knowledge one time in my head, but that's long gone, pushed out by something else. But uh, yes, yeah, so there was a lot of lot of bands. And Have you ever visited the Voices of the Saints of Bay exhibit? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Too. It is. Not that obvious. I'm proud to be part of that. Yeah. My last album was on there. Yeah, I think to put the whole album on there. It's a nice setup. Yeah. Yeah, and they're all songs, uh, stories about the area too, the same thing. And yeah, most of these, most, a lot of my books start out as songs. And like, go back to Thursday Storm, when I go back there, a book called Thursday Storm about the uh, loss of the schooner Annie Healy in 1927 from out of Fox Harbor. Um, that started as a song, and then it was a play 22 years ago, and uh, and you know that. So, if you're interested in the writing process, we could talk about that for our research or whatever. So, in five years from now, I'm going to put out because Flanker Press did that book for me, and I'm going to publish it myself in, for the hundred anniversary. And 
if I'm around in five years and able to do it, you know, that's the plan. So, exactly. Yeah. The book will be out. <laughs> there will be a book. I know it's, yeah. Yeah. But the amount of history in this area, and I had to preach that to the historical society, it's just mind blowing. There's no end to it. Like I could live to be 300 and write two books a year. Um, what I know about this place already. That's what I keep writing. We need it. anything that's free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got, uh, oddly, I, I, when I learned last year that I was having strokes, I, uh, I got a fright and my brother told me, you should write that book now that you're gonna, I said I was gonna write, wait till I was like 65 to write this book called Age of Innocence, which was the name of our band that played in the area when we were in high school. And uh, but it's, it's not about the band. And it's, it's just about, it's a coming of age book about surviving fresh water and, and then moving to school in Placentia and, and stuff like that. But it's still interesting. And part of me feels like it's gonna turn off a lot of my audience, but it's, and it's not autobio, autobiographical, is that how you say that? That's a hard one right now. And, uh, but it's, it's just about light. And I think anyone who grew up in this, even, I wouldn't say 60s, but 70s to the 90s for sure, well, like not much changes in 30 years, if anything, right? But, uh, except these days with technology, but uh, there's that. And then I'm done another book I'm writing. I've been at it for years too. Uh, it's called Hopeless Harbor. And it's set right here. Where are we? Sancho. Okay, it's right here. Like Joe Cocker when he was in LA and didn't know where he was, that he was in England. It was a joke. Anyway, uh, Hopeless Harbor, yeah, so it's, it's the narrator, the main character is, is a young French, French man uh, who's not a soldier because when he was a kid he had an injury and all that's in there too. And, and most of the story takes place during many English invasions here. And uh, yeah, so I really like that one. And my daughter, Emma, who was 13, soon be 14, she, uh, she, wanted, she, she wanted me to put some kind of a twist in it, in the story, which I've never done either. So it's, it's still historical and historically accurate, accurate but uh, it kind of goes off the rails a little bit, but it's still uh, hopefully entertaining and exciting and all that stuff. And, and I don't know how it's going to end yet because it's not finished. So. I don't plan ahead, I just go, I just write. Hopefully it ends with the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there won't be a volume two, I won't make that mistake again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you write, everyone thinks I would just write kids books, and it's like, no, 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 I just did this because Emma and Jesse and Carter is dedicated to, right? The first volume, but because I put volume two on it, and now they're, they're older and you couldn't care less about a lot of things that, because I had volume one, I had to put it volume two, but I'm glad I did because now it's a piece of placentia history for somebody, right? It takes you on a little trip through time and it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. Now what was I talking about? A little bit of everything. Hopeless, hopeless Harbor, yeah. Yeah. It's exciting, but... The amount, yeah, you'd never live long enough. If it'd be 500, you'd write books forever here. It's, yeah. Sorry, I get really excited about that stuff. Anyway, like I say, somebody's got to do it. And I've never been paid to write a book either. So, I was going to say I like that part of it, but it, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to not write because I'm not getting paid to do it. It's just do it because you love it and and that comes through, I hope, in the passion comes through in your work anyway. And uh, so how many yeah. books do you have out now? Uh, this is my eighth one to be published. Yeah. And so, and I'm, I have a book of short stories coming out in the spring and then I don't know which novel is next because I got about eight or 10 on the go all the time. And I'm jump around, jump back and forth, depending on what mood you're in. Uh, I think it'll be the Age of Innocence one, just in case. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, yeah, there's going to be a sticker on it that says uh, "No Names 
are given or names have been changed in places to, to protect the guilty. <laughs> but Darrell, it would be good to get it out sooner, not only for yourself, but all the other people that are, would, would appreciate the book. Can you repeat that, please? I say, not only would it be good for you to get it out for your sake, but also for the other people reading the book. Yes. Well. Yes, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take a gamble and do it at the risk of... I just, I say that because I may as well comment, it's like just, just, you know, everybody cursed a lot then, and... Uh, it's in the book. It's the first book I ever put a curse word in, except for Thursday Storm. There's a lot of folks in that, F-O-O-K. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's, you can't, you cannot change it, you know? Yeah, Thursday Storm was criticized uh, at some point along the way, and that, that's, that's important, too, that you do be criticized, because but if you stay true to what you're doing and you don't change the dialogue and the, the way we talk and all that stuff and you write it the same way and, you know, it, you know, someone said, well, that's, they call it like a parody of Newfoundland speech. And I said, no, I specifically, everything was verbatim from the interviews of the people for over 20 years, all the children of the survivors of, the, of that uh, schooner, the Annie Healy that was lost. And... Uh, I actually asked the publisher at the time, do you think, because it was so, some of it might be hard to read and understand, but I always say, you don't see Irish people changing anything about their, them or their culture for, to please somebody else. So you gotta kinda take that same attitude with, with writing, at least I do. And so far it's been nice, or I wouldn't be at it, so. Yeah, so that's so people who are still here and able and willing, interested in that. Yeah, because I we often everyone forgets how old they are, not meaning how old you are, but what age you are, and you know life goes by like that. And uh, yeah, so I'm I'm what fifty two, and uh, so yeah, maybe it's a really good time to get it out, <laughs> right? When you look around, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you just need to hear that from somebody else to put it in perspective, right? About everything. So always listen, even when you're losing your hearing. Any stories about this building here? And do you have oh. any connections to this building? Um. Only what I told that when I was 18, I had a friend who was the only Anglican I knew. It's just, this was the Anglican church, right? Um, and I decided to go go here with him one day, but I got stopped by uh, some old fellow outside who said, you're not allowed in here, you're Catholic. So this is my first time ever in this building, ever, because of that. So I'm happy to be here. It's a nice little, beautiful room. And what year was it built? Okay. And the one before that, I, could, I was told earlier, yeah, it was... Actually, First Catholic Church in Newfoundland is supposed to be built on this site. Okay, because there's Catholic headstones out there, isn't there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What about the? Uh, I know there. We all know there's grave, graves under the church in Placentia. I knew that a lifetime. But uh, there must. And for the convent, it was built in six, 1864. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So. And there's a graveyard there. That means there was a church there too, right? Before that one. Obviously. Well, the graveyard for the common was just for nuns who died. It's not a very big one. Half a dozen, I think. Is it? Under the church? No, the one. Oh, in the in yes, that one. Yeah, in the yard there. Yeah. Yeah. No, but the the, the church itself is buried on a graveyard. Yes, I knew that. I've seen it. Yeah. And actually, the headstones are knocked down. Yeah. In there. I'd love to go, I, now that I'm older and, and appreciate it more, the way of phrasing it, uh, I would love to, what an opportunity that would be, crawl around and explore all that. I'm sure, I'm sure someone would let you crawl under. I'm sure they would, yeah. Yeah. I'm probably not able. I'm probably, he'll come get me. Carol, buy the church and then you can do whatever you want. That's right. Buy the church. Yes. Yeah, buy the books, you know, buy the church. 
as a, a lot of books. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something you have to love to do. It's like any kind of art, as we know, I think. We're in a small place like where we are, but the best place in the world, according to me. And many others, and we choose to stay here. So, have any more questions, please? Make up some, huh? Well, we can uh, start if anybody wants to buy some of your books, make a nice yes. chance to, to buy and, and sign the books. Okay, we can do that. Sure. Let's do that. All right. So, if anyone would like a copy, I, I only have four, uh, four out of the eight. Um, I'm going to reissue the first one. If you look closely, you'll see. Probably next year, I don't know, but because it's long gone, you'll never find a copy of it. And because the publisher, Burnt Books, is defunct a long time, so. But it was nice when it happened. That's in the schools also, right? No, the second one is the tickle. It's called When We Worked Hard. Tickle Call. When We Worked Hard. Do you want to do the first one again? Uh, it's called If You Look Closely, You'll See. It was a book of short stories and poetry and stuff and and the first one that was published in Tom said it earlier 20 23 years ago yeah 1999 however long ago that was yeah yeah so if anyone's interested I have a, the garden gate uh, swept away and we can talk more about them if, if you're if you'd like whether you buy them or not and I appreciate any questions or whatever and uh, both volumes of Crunch and Munch, the uh, Talking Lobsters from Tickle Cove. Now they got placentia put on wheels. So anyway, thank you very much to the Historical Society for having me, and thank you to the wonderful crowd coming out on this beautiful Sunday.